Good evening. Hope everybody is doing well. I'm glad that you're here tonight. Uh, hope, hope you've had a good week uh, this week. And uh, it's the summertime, Brother Jerry. That humidity will slap you when you go out there. And, uh, but I'm, I'm kind of glad it's here. So, uh, anywho, uh, Acts chapter 9 is where we're going to be tonight. You're going to be, uh, be turning there. Um, and while you're doing that, we'll take prayer requests. Miss Joy Hank. One surgery, have you? Or they? Okay. Remember that. Joy Haynes uh, asked prayer for uh, for her son, uh, so you remember that, and uh, also remember Miss Joy. Uh, same, she looked pretty good Sunday, but uh, just continue to remember her. Uh, also, continue to remember Miss Teresa and Daryl and, and her family. Uh, they they got a lot going on right now, so I ask you to remember them. And uh, Lady Miss Donna Ball, she visited with us a while uh, back. And she's uh, she's asking prayer for her grandson, uh, so remember that. Also remember our vacation Bible school. That is, uh, that's less than a month away, believe it or not. Uh, so, uh, got a got a lot of lot to do. Get ready for that. Excited about that. I love vacation Bible school. Most time, most years I love when it's over too. But, uh, but it's a great uh, it's a great outreach. I'm a, I'm a product of vacation Bible school, and uh, it's a good thing. A lot of a lot of kids that. Uh, don't ever get to hear about uh, Jesus and, and the gospel. They get they get to hear about about Christ that week. So y'all be uh, y'all bathe that in prayer and, and looking forward to that. Uh, any other prayer requests? Any others? Remember Brother Jacob. All right. Uh, I ask you also to remember uh, Barentine. Uh, Barentine is preach, uh, teaching tonight. I don't know the name of the church, but he, he did say that he wouldn't be here and to remember him. So y'all remember him tonight. All right, if nothing else, we'll have a word of prayer and we will get started. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity to come to your house tonight, Father. We thank you for our brothers and sisters, Father, that we get to come together with and, and just to fellowship. Uh, God, to pray with one another and to and to learn together. And I just thank you for each one that's here. God, I pray you bless them. And God, I just thank you for them so much. Uh, we pray for tonight for the teachers. Uh, we pray for those that are uh, going to be going to be leading lessons. We pray for those that are leading rec. Uh, God, whatever the situation may be tonight, God, we pray that you would just be with them. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, receptive ears tonight. Father, God, we pray for understanding of your word. Uh, God, that we could take it and apply it to our lives that we may better serve you in a lost and dying world. God, we pray for these prayer requests tonight. Uh, God, so much going on, so many sick, so many hurting, uh, surgeries that, that have been, uh, that, that, that 
people have had and, and they're going to be having upcoming, Father. We just pray for guidance for the doctors there. And God, that you would just bless and uh, uh, in each situation. Father God, we pray for the prayer request tonight that may not be spoken, God. You know our hearts and minds here tonight. And God, we just pray that you would just uh, uh, just grant peace there, Father. We pray again uh, over your word. God, as we open it, God, you'd help us to understand it. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you that there's instruction in it. We thank you that there's learning. Uh, God, we thank you that there's purpose in it. And God, I pray that we would just uh, be a student of the word. God, I pray you would give us a desire for the word. And God, I pray that we would just learn from it. God, again, we thank you for all that you've done, all that you're going to do. And uh, we're just going to give you all the glory for it. Father, we thank you again for it all, but most of all, for Jesus. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. All right, Acts chapter number 9. If you're there, we're going to back up and look at chapter 8 for a few minutes before we move forward. Um, last week we opened, if you remember the first three verses, uh, Luke writes the book of Acts, of course, and, and Luke starts talking about a guy named Saul. And, he, and he, we learned a little bit about him uh, the week before when Stephen was executed. Uh, but, he, but he reminds us of him last week. That Saul was consenting or he was uh, kind of excited uh, under the death of Stephen. And at the time, there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. They were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And uh, verse 3 says, And for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men, and women committed them to prison. So we learned about Saul last week, that Saul was having a heyday. He was leading, almost it seems that he was leading this, uh, this persecution that was going on. And, uh, and, and he couldn't be stopped uh, by, the, by the believers there. Uh, it kind of changes gears, and we talked about uh, Philip preaching to the Samaritans and how that they, a lot of them were, were saved. And we talked about a guy named Simon, and we talked about his conversion, or was he really converted? Was it a, was it a heart knowledge or a head knowledge that he had? And we, we talked about him for a little while. And then we shifted gears again, and we talked about the Ethiopian eunuch that Peter, or not Peter, but, uh, but Philip, went and uh, by the spirit of the Lord and went to this uh, to this guy, this Ethiopian eunuch on a chariot and you remember the story, he was reading the scripture, he couldn't understand it, he didn't know what it was talking about and Philip said, dude what are you reading? And he, he read it to him and he said I know exactly what you're talking about and the Bible says that he didn't preach good works to him and he didn't preach prosperity to him and he didn't preach any. he preached Jesus to him is what he preached and the Ethiopian eunuch believed and he got saved and was baptized and the Bible says that when Philip went somewhere else to bless somebody else and to share the gospel somewhere else, that the Ethiopian eunuch was rejoicing. He went on rejoicing on his way, and I believe that he went back and made a great impact there in Ethiopia. I just couldn't help but think, I was, I was reading over this last night before I went to bed, and uh, I thought about that, that eunuch all, all night and, and, and this morning some, that, that what if he wouldn't have been faithful, or what if Philip wouldn't have been faithful unto what God called him to do? I know we can say what if about a lot of things. I get that. But seriously, some, maybe somebody else would have done it. But ain't you glad that Philip was, was obedient to what God called him to do? I believe there was a lot of Christians there in Ethiopia when this eunuch got back and told him about the conversion that he had, about the Jesus that had come into his life and saved him, all because Philip said, you know what, God, I'll go. Wherever you lead me, I'll go. And uh, I just I had that on my mind. I'm, I'm glad that, there was, uh, that there's been people throughout history that's been faithful to what God called them to do. I'm glad, I'm glad Brother Glenn Bruce was faithful to what God called him to do. Brother Glenn Bruce preached the day that I got saved. I'm glad that, that he was there and he was being obedient and preached what God had laid on his heart. And God pricked my heart and I was able to receive Christ as my Savior and Lord. I'm glad that there's those people that are obedient. And I encourage you tonight and challenge you, be obedient to what God calls you to do. We're all called to different, different things, to go different places. I understand that. But just be obedient and let God do the work. And uh, we see that's what Philip did. And so... Uh, any any questions or anything before we move on into chapter number nine? All right. So chapter nine. Um, it's almost like that. Verses one through three would have been above verse number one of chapter number nine, but it's not. And so we pick back up with Saul. And it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings 
and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest. So Saul is out and he's breathing threats and he's, uh, he's making it tough on these disciples to grow and to move forward to church. And it got to the point that he went to the high priest and he made a request of him. It says he desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, or some translations say, does anybody say the way? Anybody got that in your translation? Yeah, the way, uh, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And so Saul was, he was on a, he was on a rampage, Brother Gerald. And he was out, and he went to the high priest. He, he had a, I understand there was persecutions going on, but it's like he took his persecution to a different level. There was a, there was a certain hatred that he had there towards those Christians. Uh, he had been learned uh, in, in Judaism. He was rising uh, above many others in his learning and in his rank. I believe it's in Philippians that, that he says of himself that I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, is what, is what Paul said of himself. And uh, he just had a certain hatred that, that these Christians were coming in and they were distorting their doctrine and distorting their theology and, and changing a lot who he thought the Messiah should have been. And, and he just had a hatred. And he, so, so he went to the point to go into the high priest. And he asked of him the letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way or of the way or believers, that's what that means, whether they be men or women, that he may bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Damascus wasn't like the next town over. Damascus was 150 miles away from Jerusalem. And there was many trade routes that went. And uh, I had my study Bible at home. My daughter was supposed to bring it. I don't think she did. But it had a, it had a cool thing about Damascus. It was reading that, that there was a lot of trade. What are you laughing at, Joe? I'm blaming that on Darby. I should have brought it with me. But it was talking about Damascus and how a lot of people, there was a lot of trade that went out from, from Damascus. And it was like a central uh, area where a lot of people met and a lot of people would go out. And, uh, and, and what it was kind of getting at was the fact that, that if the gospel got to Damascus, and it was preached there, and the church began to grow there. Then it was going to it was going to spread rapidly. And Paul knew that, or Saul at this point. Saul was smart, so Saul wanted to go there, and he wanted to to, to nip it in the bud there. And that way, it would just kind of it would just kind of die out and fizzle out. That's that's what that's what Saul had in his mind. So so he he went and asked, and the high priest gave him gave him permission, gave him the letters to go and to do that. Uh, all the way in Damascus, 150 miles. That's a long way. They didn't have Z71s and Priuses back in. They had uh, they they had foot and they had donkey, I guess. And and some of the research I was doing said that if he was going to do that by foot, some of the routes that he would have to take. Uh, there was two routes that they say that he possibly could have took. It's going to take him about two weeks, two weeks to walk there. And uh, you talking about a guy that was dedicated. He was passionate about what he was doing. I'm going to tell you something. You can be passionate about doing something, but you can be passionately wrong, too. And Paul was passionately wrong. Um, and, and, and if we're not careful, I think we, we need to just make sure about our faith and, and about our doctrine and about our theology and about what we want to happen in our own spiritual growth and about what we ha want to happen in our church's spiritual growth to make sure that we're passionately right in what we're doing. I think, I think a lot of churches have skewed that. It's, it's a numbers thing, and it's a, as long as we've got people there, then it's okay. But what about are you growing spiritually? You know what I mean? Like, like we we got we to gotta make sure that we're passionate. That's a good thing if we're passionate. But let's make sure that, that it's in the right direction. And Paul was. Paul was passionate. How many people were walking 150 miles to, to share the gospel? I'm sure there was some, not, but, but not many. Paul was going there, he, but he was wrong in what he was doing. So he went. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. He was getting close. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why persecutest thou me? I don't know if your Bibles has got red letters, but mine does, and those were red letters. This was Jesus talking to him directly 
from heaven. There was a light shone from heaven. You know what the Bible says in Revelation? That Jesus is the light of heaven. He is the light of heaven. The Bible says he came down and, and he, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I was reading one commentator and he said, I want you to look intently at how, I believe it was Tony Evans, at how he closely he identifies himself with his people. Because who was he persecuting? He was persecuting the church. But yet Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Ain't you glad that he identifies that close with us? That, that he knows our pain, he knows our struggle, and he's right there with us through the midst of it. He says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Paul said, who art thou what? Lord. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the goads. Paul said, I don't know who this is or Saul. It's hard to call Paul Saul, but he's still Saul right now. <coughs> and he said, who, who are you, Lord? He, Brother Gerald, he knew something was different about this voice. He knew something was different about this light. He knew something was different about this encounter. And he called him Lord right off the bat. And Jesus responded. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the goads or the pricks. I wanted to read you what David Jeremiah said about verse number 5. So that goad was a, or a prick or a goad, same, same thing there, was a long pole with a sharp metal tip used by an ox driver to force an ox to pick up the pace. I have one in for Darby when she's slacking around the house. I got me a goad. If y'all tell her I said that, I'm going to call y'all a liar, is what I'll say. Sometimes the animal, when jabbed with the goad, would kick at it with a powerful hind leg, an action that only dug the metal tip deeper, intensifying its pain. The goad Saul was kicking against was probably his own conscience, the sense of conviction he felt over what he had done to the Christians. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the, the goads. And, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told there what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. In that terminology there, it's like they really couldn't even understand the way. They just heard a thunder. They, they, they didn't know. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor he drink. Neither did he eat nor he drink. This Saul that had been so powerful, this Saul that could not be stopped, uh, this Saul that was uh, what was growing in rank and in popularity and uh, was, was stopped by the most powerful force that he had ever seen, that any of us have ever seen. Jesus stepped down. Jesus made a difference in his life. At what point does, does conversion happen in Paul's life? I was reading that today because there's like, it, Paul never says like, I believe, you know what I mean? Like, but I believe if you look right there, what does it say? In verse number five, he says, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutes. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished. I almost think it happened about right there. He trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? I think that's pretty good uh, conviction of, of a Christian right there, is when the Lord steps in, makes a difference in your life. God, where do you want me to go? And what do you want me to do? The difference that he made in his life. He told him, he said, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men that were with him were speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. We don't hear much from these guys anymore. But the encounter that they had there on that road, I don't think it very very quickly left their minds. And I, be I believe many of them probably came to know Christ because of the, the conversion that Paul made there, or Saul, uh, and, and seeing the difference that it made once he got to Damascus and, and when he started preaching and making a difference, they said, you know what, something happened to him that was supernatural on that road. He's a, he's a new man now. That's what the Bible says, right? If any man be in Christ, he's a what? He's a new creation. We see that in Paul's life. 
that, that he is not the same. He was, he was totally transformed and in the other direction uh, when he met Christ. Amen. So he said he went on to Damascus and was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor he drank. Y'all ever had one of those experiences where you just like, you were just like numb? You know what I'm talking about? Like you didn't want to eat, you didn't want to drink, you didn't you wasn't real sure. I, I'm sure like Saul at this point is like, he's still not real sure what happened, right? He met Jesus and Jesus told him to go to Damascus and, and he's probably a little bit excited, but he's like, he's a little bit scared too because of all the all the all the heck that he's caused all these Christians and believers so far. He don't know what's fixing to happen in his life. He don't know that God's fixing to use him to be the most powerful preacher and powerful author that, that this world's ever seen. He, he don't know that. He's, he's, in a, he's in a growing process right now. Before we move on to verse number 10, uh, has anybody got anything before we go any further? Yeah. Absolutely. Anybody else? That's right. heart was right, I mean, you got to think, he's probably sitting there thinking, you know what, I deserve this. Uh, and, and and I don't know about y'all, I'm sure we've, we've all been through some some tough moments in our lives, like three days ain't really that long, but if you're going through a, a tough battle, three days can be a long time. And he's there with, with these guys, and these guys don't know what to say. And Anias is going to be there in a minute, he's a, he's a fellow brother, but these other guys don't know. Uh, but what we see this, and in those first nine verses, we see this drastic conversion experience, right? I'm talking about this is like, this is big time. Jesus steps out of heaven and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul's like, who are you and where do you want me to go? Like, like a light from heaven, he's blinded. Like, we see that drastic and that, that big time, like, conversion experience. But then as I read that, I was like, you know what? What about the Ethiopian eunuch's conversion experience? Because it wasn't like that. It was more subtle. It was more, what's this scripture mean? I'll tell you what this scripture means. The scripture means that, that Jesus loves you enough that he stepped out of heaven. The lion became the lamb, and the lamb died for your sins. The perfect lamb, sacrificial lamb of God. And the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that. I want to trust Christ as my Savior and Lord. And he was baptized. And like, like there's like a subtle conversion and then right after it there's like a drastic conversion and I think so many times people I have struggled with the fact that I don't have as, as good and as strong as a testimony as some folks do like my my conversion and my uh my my testimony just ain't as drastic as theirs I'm not like Mason Myers and didn't die for an hour and the Lord do that to me you know what I mean I wasn't on drugs I wasn't on alcohol. Like I didn't, I didn't have all of that, and yet I believe that that my conversion experience maybe it was more subtle, and maybe my testimony is not as powerful. But I believe that the power it took the same power of Christ to save me as a seven year old boy as it did to save the worst drug dealer that there was in the world. Amen. Your conversion experience, just because it ain't drastic, don't mean that it ain't powerful. It is the same Jesus died for you that died for him, and so don't I don't want us to. I think a lot of people struggle with that. I ain't got that testimony. I a pure testimony is a, is a powerful testimony. It is. It is. So, so don't, don't struggle with that. Um, Amen. 
Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. Yep. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the thing. I think there's there's testimonies like the Ethiopian eunuch because guess what? There's people like the Ethiopian eunuch. And then there's testimonies like Saul because guess what? There's there's people like Saul. You know? I mean, your testimony may reach somebody that mine won't even touch. And mine may reach somebody that yours won't even touch. But that's why we need to be willing and obedient when God says, hey, share, or hey, witness, or hey, go and encourage. Just do it. Just do it. It can be an inconvenience. I'm just going to, being a Christian sometimes ain't a convenience. It ain't. It ain't. Sometimes it takes a little sacrifice. Sometimes it takes a little obedience. But I'm going to tell you something, it's worth it every single time. Every single time. Made a difference in Saul's life. Yeah. Yeah. Very well, could be. Yeah. Bless you, Brother Jerry. Bless you. Anybody else? Amen. All right, so we move on to verse number 10. Saul's there at Damascus. 
three days without sight, ain't eating, ain't drinking, don't know. I almost think when he asked that question, what do you want me to do? Like, I don't know, and I guess we, we all say a little few different things in Scripture, but like, you may go apologize. You know, like, like, what do you want me to do? Like, what can I do for the things that I've done? And God, God tells him. Just go. I'm preparing a, pre- a preparing a thing for you. God ever told you to do something, and then you're like, okay, I'm ready now. You know what I mean? He got you got you got to go to the first step before He shows you the second step. That's happened to me several times uh, in my life. So there was a certain disciple at Damascus, verse number ten, named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold. I am here, Lord. When the Lord calls your name, are you there? Amen. And willing to willing to answer? Amen. Are you there? Sometimes the things he's fi- the thing he's fixing to ask Ananias, I'd ask the same question that Ananias is fixing to answer. I'm pretty sure, but at least he said, "Here I am. Here I am." The Lord said unto him, "Arise." And go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. I bet Ananias is thinking, there's got to be another Ananias in Damascus somewhere. There's got to be another somewhere. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard about this man. He said, I didn't hear from one about this. He said, I've heard from many about this man. And how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. I've heard the havoc that he's caused. I've heard the, uh, the, the persecution that he, is, that he has brought forth. I've heard all those things. And, and here he hath authority from the chief priest to to bind all that call on thy name. Ananias says, I know what he's done in Jerusalem. I know he's got permission to come here and do the same thing. Word traveled pretty fast. Hey, the rumor didn't just spread like fast right now. It spread fast back then too. I don't know how it got there so fast, but it did. It did. But the Lord said to him, go thy way. Listen to this. For he's a chosen vessel unto me. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. What a tall task Ananias is given. This guy's, I got in a debate about this with a guy one time. The Bible never says that Paul killed anybody, Saul killed anybody, but he was right there and he witnessed a bunch of it. And he held the clothes of those that were being to like He was there just as well had. All right? And God's asking Ananias to go. I couldn't help but think. I was reading a little bit of David Jeremiah, and he, he brought up the fact that it's kind of like kind of like when God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. Like Nineveh was a bunch of punks. Like they, they, were, they were evil, and they did a bunch of things that was contrary to God's word. And, and Jonah's like, Lord, I don't. Actually, John, I don't even think Jonah said anything. Jonah just went the other way and got on a boat. Y'all remember that? And, and Ananias kind of, I mean, he's asking him to do the same thing, but praise God for Ananias. He's like another Philip. God told him to go, and, and he was a little apprehensive about it, but guess what he did? He went. And, and he gave him assurance. God did in verse 15. It says, Go thy way. Go where I told you to go, for he's a chosen vessel unto me. I'm going to tell you something. Just because you had a rough past and just because you've made decisions that not, might not be very good and, 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 and there may be, you may be a lot of baggage, I'm going to tell you something. That baggage is forgotten at the cross. And God can use anybody, anywhere, at any time. And he had a work for Paul to do. Think about your Bibles. After the book of Acts, how many of them was written by Paul? The majority the majority. He had a great work for him to do. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For 
for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him. Listen what he calls him. Brother Saul. Brother Saul, he knew he had been blood-bought and born again. I believe, I believe God gave him that confirmation in his heart that you can go, it is safe. He is one of ours now. He is on your side. He is on your team, and he is one of ours. He called him Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared to thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. I'm glad sometimes that all it takes is a brother in Christ to come along and help you out along the way. What if Ananias wasn't a win? It says that, that he went and he just put his hand on his back and said, Brother Saul, I know you're one of ours now. I know you've been saved. God's told me what's happened to you. He's going to use you. And the Bible says immediately, immediately, there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. You know what a sigh of relief. John brought that up a while ago. He probably thinks that I'm blind the rest of my life. This blinding light that I have encountered, I'm blind the rest of my life. You know what a relief he had? He had a brother in Christ that's on his side. Do you know how probably, probably what he thought? These Christians ain't going to approach me. They're not going to have anything to do with me. But he had a brother come along the way and put his arm around him and say, Brother, I'm with you. I'm going to be with you. And the Bible says he received his sight. His sight was, was given back to him. He was, and he arose and was baptized. He received meat and he was strengthened. Then Saul, then was Saul. He stayed there certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. You think they carried a pocket knife in their pocket just in case? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It's all going to be the same today as he was yesterday. And it says it. big deal pretty big deal and straightway verse number 20 he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God I remember my first sermon I preached it at Union Grove I was 18 month of August uh, I was going to start school the next day brother Gerald at Sneed State I remember that and uh, boy I had fretted over that first sermon. I bet that first sermon, I bet it lasted maybe 10 minutes. Maybe. I don't know. I tried to tell a joke when I first got up there just to kind of relieve my nerves. That was probably the longest part of the, the sermon. But I, but I just remember declaring that, that Jesus is God's son and that he loves you. And, and I just remember that. And I almost think about this this right here that, that, that Paul, if I call him Paul one more time, y'all say something. Saul he probably didn't have a whole lot of words to say. He know he knowed a lot of Old Testament stuff, but but he hadn't seen a whole lot, and and he didn't know. I tell you what, he did know. He knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and he had made a drastic transformation in his life. And the Bible says that he preached straightway, straightway. He preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, "Is not this he that destroyed he, uh, them?" which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews, which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. I'm thankful for, the, I'm thankful for conversion. And I'm thankful for the process of sanctification, ain't you? The Bible says that he continued to grow. I'm going to tell you something. If you're a blood-bought, born-again believer in Christ, we ought to continue to grow. We shouldn't ever be settled where we're at. Uh, we shouldn't ever be complacent, but we should always desire to grow forward in the Lord. And the Bible says that that's what Saul did. He increased more the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is 
of the very Christ. All right, has anybody got anything in those set of verses? I guarantee you that's probably the only thing he said there. I think that's in verse 21, that's where that they were all amazed. I think that's where they come in. Anybody? We're going to keep moving forward. Don't you love your Bible? Verse 23 says, And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to him, to kill him. So it's the same thing that he was conspiring to do, now they're conspiring to do to him because he's making such a difference to the name of Jesus. Verse 16, Jesus told Ananias, that he said, I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. They're laying, verse 24, but their laying a weight was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. They were waiting on Saul to leave. They were going to kill him. And the Bible says that they conspired a plan to let him down by the wall in a basket. Who, the Jews? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's... Many times, I, Billy Graham, I was, I was listening to an insert sermon of his, and uh, he was talking about the, the parable of the sower and how that there's, that there's three types of bad ground and there's one type of good ground. And he said, he said I'm not very good at math, but I tell you this, there's about a 25% chance when you witness that that, that seed might take root. He said, so don't get discouraged on those, those other 75%. Just keep sharing the gospel. The only way Paul to get out was these disciples took him and let him down by a basket on the wall. I thought about that a little while today, and 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 and, and I'm just gonna be honest to you. Sometimes ministry's tough. Sometimes being a Christian, oh, we talk about that a lot. It's a joyous life. Don't get me wrong, but there's there's tough times. I'm thankful for those people in my life and in my ministry, maybe even the ministry of this church that have held on the rope. That maybe maybe we were swimming, we were in that basket and we're trying to get out of there and, and I, I'm thankful for those people that held onto that basket for me that, that maybe I was and I was struggling I was I was I didn't feel like I could make it out but praise God they had a plan they conspired a plan for Paul and they they held the rope they let him down by the wall in a basket and Saul was able to escape Damascus and he was come to Jerusalem in verse 26 and he essayed to join himself to the disciples listen to this but they were all afraid of him. They hadn't heard of what happened in Damascus. They hadn't heard about him preaching in the synagogues. They hadn't heard about all of that. They were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them continuing in and going out of Jerusalem and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they were about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. They were multiplied. That dude Barnabas in verse number 27, we've all talked about Barnabas, heard about Barnabas. His name means son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. We talked about how Ananias, John hit on that a second ago, about how much of an encouragement he was there in Damascus and how 
Now we're back at Jerusalem, and, and guess what? Saul ain't got any friends in Jerusalem. Everybody's scared of him. They don't want to get close to him. And, and, and thank God for Barnabas. He comes and puts his arm around him, learns his testimony, learns his story. He goes to the other disciples and said, listen, it's okay. He's one of us now. He's been saved. He, he, is, he is on his way to heaven, and he is a disciple. He's an apostle of the gospel. And uh, I'm thankful for people like that. And I encourage you to be a Barnabas. There's enough of enough, enough people filling pews today, pointing fingers at others. Charlie brought it up earlier, judging sin, judging where somebody used to be. I'm going to tell you something. You're not the same after Jesus comes into your life. And we ought to realize that about people. So many times we're still sketched out by somebody after they get saved. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be. And Barnabas wasn't. Barnabas went to him. He, he took the time to listen to him. There's a lot of people in this world that just need, need you to take a little time just to listen to them to put an arm around him, to encourage him, and that's what he did. He took him, he brought him to the apostles, declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Verse 31 says, Then had the churches rest throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, walking, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And they were multiplied. Do you think that rest, that they had rest because they know that Saul was on their side now? Is that why they had rest? Persecution would be less strong now. I don't, I don't, I don't exactly know. But it said they had rest throughout all of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Anybody got anything in those last set of verses there? right absolutely I've said this several times and it hurts me to say it every time but Alabama's football coach Nick Saban he talks about why they're so successful is why it's a process it's a process our Christian life is a process it really is and like Sam said it, it takes time to grow it takes time to become uh, a better scholar of the Bible. It takes time to be a better prayer. Is that a word, prayer? It takes time to be a, a better preacher. It takes time to be a better encourager. It, it's a learning curve, learning process. Amen. It's like Jacob talked about the other night. You're, amen, amen. job to do. Amen. Barnabas didn't quit being an encouragement. I may be wrong on this, but did Paul and Barnabas not get into it about John Mark? And Paul and Barnabas spat at me, and, and guess what? Barnabas chose encouragement again. and uh, that, that was his gift. That, that was what he was called to do. Chosen to be. It was an encouragement. That's right. Anybody else? Any questions?
All right, next week we will uh, shift gears back. We'll start in verse number 32, uh, Peter, and a couple of cool stories right there uh, involving Peter. And uh, then we'll get over there to old Cornelius. My dad used to work with a guy, and his name was Cornelius, and I'll just let you guess what color he was. Uh, we called him Big C. That was my dad. He was a maintenance supervisor at a, where he worked. And he got all his guys come over Fourth of July and had a swimming party. And Big C, let me tell you something. He do a cannonball better than anybody I've ever seen. Man. Uh, uh, every time I see Cornelius, I think of him. He's a great guy. Any other word tonight before we dismiss? If you love your Bible, say amen. If you love Jesus, say amen. amen. All right. Well, if nothing else, don't forget Mother's Day, Sunday, I believe. Is that right? Mother's Day. So y'all where are you? We may preach to the mamas a little bit, depending on where the Lord leads us. Uh, but y'all keep that in mind for Sunday. Anything going on Sunday? night service, that's right. Uh, say what I got to deal with, Deacon Lord. There you are. Don't forget about that. I think, I don't know, if Miss Darby announced it, there's some material on the back table for VBS if you've got different ministries, whatever you're doing there. So I think she said that on the back table. So. If nothing else, we will be dismissed. Hope you have a blessed rest of the week. Hope to see you Sunday. If not, I know there's a lot of decorations going on Sunday. Uh, y'all uh, y'all love on the Lord Sunday. Love on your mama Sunday. And uh, if we don't see you Sunday, good Lord willing, we'll see you this time next week, 7 o'clock. Brother Jason Bryan. Love you, brother. You dismiss us. <laughs>